welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, glad to have Ken Hutcherson back with us again as we're talking about this week's Sunday School lesson, a small group Bible study, as we talk about Luke chapter 7 and look at the love that God has for all of us. You know, this past Sunday was Valentine's Day when people celebrate love, but we want to talk about uh, an even greater love, and that is the love of God that is expressed through Jesus Christ. So I'm glad that we have this lesson. It's a timely lesson for all of us. We need yes. to know about the love of God. And we've got a very important uh, message to share this morning about the love that God has for each one of us. So, uh, Kim, why don't you get us started this morning? Yes, it's a great lesson today. We, uh, I'm excited about teaching this right here and sharing with you today. Uh, just to bring us up to speed a little bit as a reminder, last week, remember, we was in Luke chapter 6, and we learned that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, that he created the Sabbath rules. And so he can actually do with the Sabbath rules anything he wants to, which got him sort of crossways with the Pharisees. But we've also learned the more important thing, that he's more concerned about meeting the needs of individuals than he is about meeting the needs of rituals and religious actions. Uh, see, the Pharisees criticized and complained about the acts of love and kindness that he performed, but you know what? It never discouraged Jesus. And as I read and thought about that, we should never be discouraged because the world criticizes us because of what we do in the name of Jesus. Uh, even though he could see their thoughts, Jesus could read the scribes and Pharisees' thoughts of disapproval about the Sabbath. He continued to minister to people who were hurting. He didn't ever worry about what people thought. Today in Luke chapter 7, we're actually going to discover Jesus ministering and demonstrating the compassion of, and love of God for mankind uh, as he encounters hurting individuals. Uh, in this chapter, you find him meeting the needs of a dying servant of a Roman centurion. Uh, you see him meeting the needs of a grieving widow on the way to bury her child. And you see him answering questions for John the Baptist. And in today's lesson, we're going to focus on a repentant, unnamed woman, just known as a sinner, and his love that he bestowed on her. Warren Worsby states that compassion is defined, your pain in my heart. I want to repeat that, and I want you to think about that. Compassion is your pain in my heart. How much compassion do I have for the hurting people that I encounter day by day? Today, if confronted with similar circumstances, as Jesus would, multiple needs, multiple uh, circumstances, you know, we'd probably form a committee uh, and struggle with which one needed the need the most. Uh, we'd probably study it, we would take a vote, and then we would meet one of the needs. But that wasn't Jesus, because see, Jesus, as he went about, whenever he encountered a need, he reached out and met that need. He touched those people. He loved those people. And he wants us to know that he loves us, and he can meet us at our point of need. It was the compassion for man that motivated the great physician to send his son. And as Luke 19.10 says, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Ever since God called out to Adam, where are you, Adam? He's been calling out to all of us. It's always been God's love for mankind that's motivated him to intervene in the affairs of men throughout history because he's trying to draw us back to him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Our scripture today comes from Luke 7, 36 through 50. If you have your Bible or your Sunday school quarterly, let's look, look at these verses. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she leaned, learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair on her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who that was and what sort of person this is, this woman is who is touching him, and she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. 
A money lender has two debtors, and one owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave both of them. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Our lesson today demonstrates our theme for this month, love to all. It shows how Jesus bestowed his love and compassion on a woman who was only named a sinner and how she demonstrated her love to Jesus for what he had done for her. Today's lesson truth is a foundational truth of the gospel. Jesus saves all who comes to him in faith. That includes you and me. Kenneth, why do you think Simon, a Pharisee, would have invited Jesus to his home for a meal? Well, you know, as we've been studying in, in Luke, Jesus would come often and eat with different people. We saw in chapter five that he was eating with Levi, who we know is Matthew, the tax collector. And he, as a tax collector, his own race didn't even like him because he was really betraying them by being a tax collector. Mm -hmm. And he was viewed by most people as a sinner. So if Jesus would eat with a sinner, he'd definitely eat with a Pharisee, wouldn't he? <laughs> so, but Jesus always was purposeful wherever he went. And he had an intention. It didn't matter the intention of the people that, were, that had extended the invitation. Jesus was on mission, and we've talked about that the last couple of weeks, That's that right. Jesus had a mission, and his mission was to fulfill the Father's will, to point people to him as the Messiah. So he, he was always fulfilling that mission, so he probably readily accepted these invitations because regardless of the reasoning for the person that invited him, he was going to be able to share some spiritual truth and point them to, the, uh, to him as the Messiah. So usually with the Pharisees, he was pointing he was correcting their wrong spiritual beliefs. Absolutely. And people today have wrong spiritual beliefs. So That's we need right. to look towards Scripture. We need to look towards the teachings of Christ and, and be able to have, have our beliefs in line with God's Word. That's right. Because that's and the most important said, thing. We need to learn to be on mission. Yeah. Not just live. We need yeah. to be on mission. I mean, we're Baptists. We all like to go eat. So, uh, <laughs> but there's purpose in those things. That's and right. purpose in relationships. That's and right. there's there's opportunity to, to point people towards the truth of the gospel. And that's what Jesus is doing right here. So we don't know why, the Bible is not clear, so we don't wanna read into it too much of, of exactly why. Was Simon wanting to know who Jesus is? Was Simon wanting to, to find out a little bit more about him? Because you know he was a Pharisee, so he was trying to, to, to find out Jesus' intent. No doubt he heard about what Jesus had been doing, the miracles that had taken place, the healings that had taken place. He had to have known that Jesus referred to himself as a son of man. He had to know that, that Jesus was, was saying that he had the power to forgive sins, yep. that, he, that he was healing people physically as well. So he, he knew all these things. So whether it was just to try to find out a little bit more, uh, we really don't know. But we know he probably wanted to learn from him in some form or fashion. It was probably just dependent on what he wanted to do with that knowledge. That's right. Was he trying to to find out more for himself, or was he trying to try or to know more about God, or was he trying to uphold his status of being a Pharisee? So we really don't know. But whatever his motivation, Jesus used this opportunity to share with Simon and us today spiritual truth, right. what God is really looking for in in our lives. So um, so the reason that Simon invited Jesus is not as important as the lesson we learned today. What God wants each of us to know is that he loves each one of us. That's right. That he cares for each one of us. And and we'll we'll do, you know, we'll dive into this a little bit more, but but for Simon to say, hey, that, you know, that's a sinner. Doesn't he know that's a sinner? And and you know, when we start focusing on on other people and their sin, we forget that we're sinners saved by grace too. That's right. 
that, that we need that same forgiveness that Jesus is, Jesus offered. So we see Simon there. We see Jesus there. There was a lot of other people there too. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was open for, for people to come by. But obviously, we see the lady there. The end of the passage tells us there was other people there. And that was, that was, that was uh, not out of the ordinary. But people didn't sit around at a table like we're sitting around a table right now. They would recline. They wouldn't be sitting in chairs like we're sitting in chairs. They would recline around a the table. Their feet would be kind of away from them. And it was a little bit different than, than, what, we, than what we see today. It's also like if I invited you over to, to my house to eat with me, I might not expect an uninvited guest to be there. But it was very common in those days for an invited guest to be there. There could also be needy people there. That's right. Because if they were having some kind of banquet, if they were having a lot of food, there would be people there that, that were hungry, mm-hmm. and they may come by to get some food as well. So Luke doesn't identify this woman, only to say that she was a sinner. Most likely, uh, from the context of this, she was a woman of the street. She had a, a bad reputation. Uh, she may have heard Jesus speak at a previous uh, a previous time of ministry. Uh, we just don't know, but in some form or fashion, she heard about Jesus, and right. Jesus had made a difference in her life. So we don't know exactly what that was, but it, it must have been powerful because she wouldn't do what she's about to do if she had not not known who Jesus is. So she heard Jesus was right there in her town in Simon's house, so she went right over there to show her love and gratitude for what Jesus had done for her. Right. And that's a key concept, and really it's the focus of our lesson today, our, our passage, is the gratitude we have as believers for what God has done in our, each one of our lives. And we don't see her saying anything, but we see some great action mm-hmm. in the steps that she took. Her actions expressed how deeply grateful she was for what Jesus had done for her, for the love, the compassion, the forgiveness, and I even believe acceptance mm-hmm. that, that Jesus had for her. And that's something that, that's important for all of us to, to really realize. We can, we can be grateful for what God does, but let's not ever forget the, the acceptance that we get in Christ. Because it's easy not to feel accepted. And it's also easy easy for us to not accept others who are different than us. Exactly. Because Simon was a religious leader of the Pharisees, and this lady was a sinner. And they didn't have anything to do with each other, usually. No. They, they didn't interact with each other. Those religious leaders wouldn't even talk to women. Yeah, the Jewish men didn't talk to women in public, mm-hmm. ever. Even if they weren't a sinner. Okay, yeah. they didn't talk to them, mm-hmm. uh, and so to much less talk to a woman of this this class. And you see that the difference that Jesus makes because Jesus didn't pull away from her. Yeah, if she'd have done that to Simon, not that she would have, he would have pulled away. Yeah, he wouldn't have anything to do with. It would have made him unclean. Yeah, it would have made him unclean. He was probably even uncomfortable with her being there. Yeah, but Jesus doesn't pull away. Jesus doesn't tell her to stop. Jesus accepts her in her sincerity. He realizes not only what she's doing, but why she's doing it. Because it's an expression of her love for him and the only way that she knows how to do it. That's right. That would make a difference. So our actions, this woman's actions reflected her love for Jesus and the gratitude that she had for him. And you know, we think about that today. What are some ways or how do we, you know, it's even a rhetorical question a little bit. How do we reflect that? What do we do in, in our lives? Uh, you know, that's that's a great question because I think as Christians, so many times we take this idea of Jesus's love and forgiveness for granted. Okay. Oh, yeah. Especially for a person that's been a Christian for any length of time. Mm-hmm. Well, I know Jesus loves me and he knows I love him, so mm-hmm. I really don't need to do anything. That's right. But the world needs to see that we're that we love Jesus. And this is what what this lady is doing. Her outward actions is demonstrating her love. You mentioned the word acceptance, that she was she felt accepted, okay? Um mm-hmm. uh, and up to this point, she was used by men. She was abused mm-hmm. probably by men uh, and looked down on. That's but right. here was Jesus who accepted her right where she was at and loved her and didn't expect anything out of her. Mm-hmm. And she knew that. And like you said, that was probably a great burden off of her that mm-hmm. I'm finally accepted for who I am. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's important for all of us yeah. because we're all different. And it may have never happened before. It may, it may, it may be the it only probably. time in her life she's ever truly felt accepted by anyone. That's right. That's right. Because we don't know how her life started and what type of life mm-hmm. drove her into being mm-hmm. a woman of the street. Uh, but like previous encounters with the Pharisees, uh, Jesus, and, and I, I love this, and especially in Luke, because Luke always points out that Jesus knew what the Pharisees were thinking. Mm-hmm. That's another indication that he was God in the flesh, because mm-hmm. he's the only one that I, I can look over here at you uh, and I, I know that you're probably thinking about your next part of this lesson, okay? <laughs> but I can't tell what you're really thinking. That's right. But God knows what both of us are thinking. Mm-hmm. God knew what the Pharisees were was thinking, and He knew what Simon was thinking uh, about if this one, uh, if Jesus was a real prophet, and He uh, would know that Simon, that the kind of woman that was anointing His feet. But so uh, He also knew that Simon didn't love this woman. Hmm. He, he actually said, well, since God hates sin, I'm supposed to hate sin, so I hate this woman. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he had no intention of trying to bring her to Christ. Mm-hmm. That was not in his... But Jesus was about to demonstrate to Simon that he is a prophet, yeah. okay? Because he's going to demonstrate, Simon, I know what you're thinking. Yeah. And I'm fixing to read it back to you. Uh, and it's always easier to hate somebody else's sin. Oh, it is. It's, it is. Than, than uh, focus on our own. Yeah, and, and as Jesus normally did, he used a parable. He taught this parable about two people. And we hear a, a lot right now in the pandemic, there's a lots of people hurting and they've got debt. And we're hearing about debt forgiveness for school loans and all kinds of things going mm-hmm. on. But Jesus told this parable about two individuals, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50, which is equivalent to $50,000 and $5,000 uh, based on today's standard. But neither could pay their debt back. But instead of throwing them in prison, the creditor forgave them, okay? And both of the debtors were now freed of obligation and could go about their lives. I don't know if you've ever had any debt uh, that you were struggling to pay for, but that can be a real burden on you, Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, And it's on your mind constantly. Mm -hmm. But after he told this story, he turns to Simon, and ask a question. Jesus, we could learn a lot about evangelism by just listening to how Jesus evangelized other people. Mm -hmm. He asked him a question. Uh, Luke 7, 42 says, and when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Now remember, Simon's a Pharisee. and He's looking at Simon and says, Simon, which of these would love him more? Um, And it was actually, this question was not a a question of the law, Mm -hmm. okay? This was a question of the heart. Mm-hmm. It's a question of the heart. And I can just see Simon. Now, he's a Pharisee. Keep in mind. And he's going to say, ah, i got to answer this guy's question. Um, so, well, I suppose the one who forgave him more. He, he probably didn't want to give that answer. He probably mm-hmm. was wanted to be able to give a legal answer. And the man with the larger debt thus was subject to the harsher penalty. Uh, and Jesus told him, says, well, you've judged correctly. And by using this parable, Jesus just demonstrated to Simon, and Simon probably didn't even recognize this, that an educated religious leader had the capacity to recognize a moral conclusion, mm-hmm. okay? But it remained to be seen if Simon would see how the parable applied to him. What Jesus was actually doing was talking and giving a parable about Simon mm-hmm. uh, and the woman that was there, uh, that uh, this woman had actually demonstrated her love by recognizing how much she was forgiven, but Simon, the one who had less debt, didn't recognize that he'd even been forgiven, all right? Like the man with the large debt, the parable and the repentant woman in Simon's house, we should demonstrate our love for God about everything. We've been forgiven much. I know who I am. I know what I've done, but I have to ask myself, Do I really demonstrate my love for Jesus for what he's done in my life? The Father's forgiven us much, and our gratitude for this forgiveness should match the generosity and graciousness that he's done for us. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he, God, will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he, God, has abundantly pardoned us. God has abundantly pardoned us. 
1 John 3, 1, see how great a love the Father, love, the love that the Father has bestowed on us that he would, we would be called children of God. See, when God forgave that sinful woman, she became a child of God. And that's what each of us are. Think about it. Do you recognize yourself as a child of God? That's a that's an important question because Jesus did demonstrate that love right there and wanted people to, to know. He wanted not just us to know today, but he wanted Simon. There was a guy named Simon that's who right. needed to understand how much God God really loved him. And he wanted Simon to demonstrate the sin, yeah. to recognize, mm-hmm. look, at I, I've been forgiven. Yeah. And he wanted that, you know, you think about it like a stream. You want that, that water to keep flowing. That's right. It, it got, he, Jesus wanted it to flow into, into Simon, and he wanted it to be, he wanted Simon to be able to extend it to this, this one he saw as a sinner. That's right. But her greatest need, or her greatest, her greatest need is just like our greatest need is. She needed a savior. She did. And Simon did as well. So we see that, that God's love is demonstrated. And even though Simon had all the right answers, Jesus was right in front of him. And he was he was missing it. He was missing it. So and that and that happens often. That happens today. That happens to people today. Yeah. And and it doesn't just happen to to uh, to people outside the church. It happens to people inside the church. Yes. You know we 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 start seeing things differently. We don't we don't we don't remember the high price that was paid for our salvation and what God has done in our lives. So you think about this, Jesus asks an important question. We're looking at verses 47, 44 through 47. And do you see this woman? And, you know, a lot of times when we say, you know, things like that, do you see them? Yeah, I, I see her. She's right here. But do you really see her? Do you really see her? You know, do you really see her as a person? You know, you didn't even, you might have known who she was, but you didn't even call her by name. You just said, you were just thinking of her as a sinner. And... That's not how God wants us to see people. Yeah. So do you really see her, number one, as a person, a person of value, a person of worth? But even more so, do you see her the way God sees her? That's right. That's right. Her pain in your heart. That's right. Do you have that kind of compassion? So, and the, the thing about it, when you read it, Jesus doesn't even really give him a chance to answer. No. He jumps right in and before Simon has a chance to say anything and begins to contrast Simon's behavior since his arrival at Simon's house versus what the woman did mm-hmm. and how the woman treated him in his house. Um, there was, just like there's common hospitality today, there was common ho- hospitality that was a little bit different in, in Jesus' time than it is today, but you were expected to be hospitable to to your company. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like this was in Jewish law that Simon had to do these things. It was just what what was the the standard that people would do when somebody, when a guest came over, especially someone who's an important person or a teacher. The the common things that you would do uh, for anybody when they come over to your house, remember they wore sandals and their primary mode of transportation was their feet. And, And you know what happens to your feet, they get dirty. But Simon didn't do anything to offer Jesus any basic hospitality. He didn't offer him any. Jesus mentioned he didn't offer me any water to, to clean my feet. You didn't offer to clean my feet. You didn't offer me anything to clean my feet myself. Any of these things you didn't do. So he says in there, you didn't greet me with a kiss. And that was common in that time. Right. Even for men, they would, they would give just a little a kiss on the cheek as, mm-hmm. a, as a form of greeting. He said, you didn't do any of these things to express that I am welcome that, that you accept me, that, that you're glad I'm here. So you extended this invitation and doesn't, it doesn't even seem like you're glad I'm here. That's right. So uh, that's one, one, that was Simon's reaction to Jesus. And he didn't anoint him either, is a, anoint his head with oil, which was a sign of a, a honor to a guest. But in contrast to that, we see this woman and she broke out that alabaster flask mm-hmm. and she anointed Jesus. She she washed his feet with her tears, which is, you know, you, you it doesn't say it expressly, but you can read into it right there. That is very humbling. Yes. You think about that, that she got down at his dirty feet and washed them with her tears and her hair as an expression of gratitude. I just can't get over how much Jesus has done in my life, and I have to show him in some tangible way right. that I, I'm sincere that, I, that I'm thankful for what he has done. So we think about, about Jesus's reaction as we continue. 
And you, when you think about Simon, the the lady, the the woman, she didn't think she needed to be. She she realized she did need to be forgiven. Simon didn't think he needed to be forgiven much or at all. That's right. So we see that contrast. Then we move into verse 48 and 50. And as, as we do that, you think of, about it a lot in, in the South, and it's not so much as it used to, but cultural Christianity. Mm-hmm. People will come to church because that's what you're supposed to do. And they don't they don't think about the high price that was paid for their salvation. They, they come to church on Sunday morning because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed and to do. And they don't they don't express their love for Christ. I mean, you, you can sort of compare like that. A Pharisee. Yeah. I mean, you compare that. You see people go, when we used to be able to go to sporting events versus people when they come to church. Right. They're, they're, they're just sitting there and they're, they're, it's almost like some people are just enduring a worship service because that's what you're supposed to. That's right. But a worship service is a reflection of what, what Christ has done in our life. And that's we're right. there to worship. That's right. And we should really think about all that God has done for us. We'd be in bad shape without Jesus. Oh, I, I can't imagine my life without Jesus, uh, with all that, that, that I, I see how he's taken care of me through the years and how he's protected me mm-hmm. and guarded me. And I'm so thankful for that. I wouldn't be the man I am today if it wasn't for Jesus. That's right. Okay. That's right. So we think about that. You know, it helps us think about, you know, we want to always apply these passages, think about, you know, we put ourselves in here. Sometimes we had always identify with a hero. You know, Jesus Jesus was the one that was teaching spiritual truth. Jesus was the one that was forgiven sins. Jesus is always the quote unquote hero of these passages. And we identify, well, I would be just like Jesus. Right. But we got to make sure we are. are we, and, but sometimes are we like Simon and we don't really appreciate and are thankful and, and, and show gratitude for all that God has done for us. So it's very important to, to realize um, that that sometimes we're not the hero in in, in these stories, that, in no. those passages, that we need to realize that that hey, am I showing enough gratitude? That's right. I mean, Jesus is Jesus' desire was for Simon to express the same kind of gratitude that the woman was, because mm-hmm. who could Simon have an impact on? Other scribes and Pharisees. That's right. Okay. Jesus wanted Jesus's desire. We focus a lot of time on Jesus' encounter with scribes and Pharisees, and it always seems mm-hmm. like a negative event. Mm-hmm. But see, Jesus really desired for them to have a relationship with him, too. That's right. He, re- he wants all men. Jesus desires that all men be saved and mm-hmm. that none should perish. Mm-hmm. Okay? But uh, and he, that's, his, that's that love he has for mankind. So Jesus says something here very powerful. He looks at, at the expression of love and gratitude in the sincere heart of this woman, and he looks at her and says, your sins are forgiven. Yep. Very powerful statement. Yes. And in the, the passages from the last few weeks in Luke, we see that, that, uh, that usually when he forgives somebody's sins, then he starts dealing with the, the Pharisees. Yep. But he really just ignores them yep. at this point. He doesn't deal with them quite yet. Uh, he wanted them to know that this woman was forgiven because of her faith, and her faith that had saved her, and he told her to go in peace. See, when the when again, when Simon looked at, at the woman, he saw her sin. But that's not that's not how Jesus looked at her. He saw the sincerity of her faith. Um, he saw that she repented. He saw her devotion. And Simon looked at her past, and Jesus looked at her not as not at her past, but as her future. He focused on where she was right now. He forgave her of her sins and knew that her future would be secure. Exactly. And and we should look at people who come to our church, who come to Hopewell, who come to know Jesus Christ. They may come, they may have been alcoholic or drug addict or whatever in their life. But we have to understand that whenever they accept Jesus, they're now coming in line with his plan for their life. And it, whenever he they get in line with his plan, we don't know what Jesus is going to do with them. That's right. Okay. If they stay surrendered and they obey him, he can do marvelous and miraculous things for them and mm-hmm. through them. Yep. We think about Ephesians 2 8. It says this For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And we think about that. Um, there's no there's a lot of a lot of different things you could say about that passage, but it is God's grace. That's right. That's it, right. it doesn't say by 
church attendance, you have been saved. Yeah. It certainly doesn't say by your judgment of others, you have been <laughs> saved. Right. Or your comparison with others. For your comparison. And it certainly doesn't say, you know, by what religious group you're in. That's right. That, that you're saved. It says by by grace you have been saved. And it means we simply just can't earn it. That's right. There, it's God's grace. Don't, there, you know, it's like a, it's like a, our salvation is almost like a contract. And the only thing we bring to the table is that we're sinners who need to be saved. That's right. God brings salvation. That's right. And we need, the, and we bring the fact that we need to be saved. We come bring and that, that puts us on equal standing with everybody. It doesn't make one better than the other. Uh, and it's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And the only thing that I would say about that, and we could just do a whole, whole session on Ephesians 2 way. Well, that's a whole lesson. That's a whole lesson in itself. But it, for a gift to truly be a gift, it's got to be received. You think about it. We're, you know, as this is being broadcast February 21st, I doubt people still have Christmas gifts under the trees. I know some people have celebrated Christmas later this year because of COVID. They weren't able to get together with their families or stuff like that. But I doubt very few people still have a gift under a tree. That's that right. gift's got to be received. And that that's what Jesus is trying to get that woman, I mean, the, the, trying to get Simon to see, and that woman knew that the, that the gift is Jesus. That's right. So that's we right. need to remember that today. So Kim, why don't you walk us through some final thoughts on this? On this passage this morning, the uh, yeah, this is a, a, a great lesson. We can't justify. It. Simon thought he was justified uh, by his religious actions, mm -hmm. by his religious uh, uh, knowledge, by his uh, status. Even he thought that he was justified, but he deceived himself. First John one eight says, "If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us." Simon thought he had all the truth that he had all the religious answers, but he didn't. He was deceiving himself that day, and his actions actually revealed the sins that were in his life, the sins of pride and hypocrisy, harsh judgmental attitudes, self-righteousness, coldness, lack of compassion, and most importantly, his unbelief of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, I had to ask myself, do I deceive myself sometimes? Do I deceive myself in my belief? See, Simon did what lots of us do. He compared himself to other people whose sins are blatant and offensive. He compared himself to the woman of the street, probably a prostitute. He compares himself to the homosexual, the thief, a rapist, a murderer, pornographer, a drug dealer. Uh, and of course, if we compare ourselves to those people, we come out looking pretty good. But actually, we're no better than they are. We're no better than they are. Have you ever thought about looking at yourself through God's perspective, under the light of the Holy Word, the Bible. Look at yourself through that. That's what God gives us the word for, is for us to understand who we are and how much he loves us, but also how much we need him, okay? How much we need him. See, God's word tells us that there is none righteous, not even one, Romans 3.10. Guess what? That's all of us. Mm -hmm. That's you, that's me, that's, right. that's Wesley over there behind the camera, all right? That's all of us. Romans 3.23 says, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God's word assures us that because his love for us and our faith in him, we can also have peace in our lives. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, okay, Christ died for us. Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by what? Good works? No. By faith, That's right. okay, we have peace. What did Jesus tell that lady to do? Go in peace, okay, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have to ask myself, do I live a life of gratitude that's visible to others because God's love for me? Again, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Like the woman in our lesson, do our actions reflect our gratitude to Christ as deeply and passionately for how much he, we have been forgiven? You know, John three sixteen that you just read is probably a very familiar passage. If you know only a, a few verses of Scripture, you've probably heard that before. I mean, you see people at, at sporting events back when we used to could go to sporting events, somebody always had a John three sixteen sign, yeah. or you probably have heard that. 
but I always like to personalize that. And I think about that, uh, you know, for God so loved the world, I like to put my name in there. I Amen. say, for God so loved Kenneth that he gave his only begotten son that if Kenneth would believe in him, he should not perish but have eternal life. And the same thing for you. So think about that passage. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that if you would believe in him and trust him as your Lord and Savior, that you would not perish, that you would not spend eternity separated from God, that you would have eternal life and, and live with God forever. So you think about that today. Simon had a view of who he thought Jesus was. He viewed Jesus as an important person. And that may be like you. You might just think, hey, Jesus is an important person. I hear people talk about Jesus. He's an important person. Or do you view Jesus like the woman viewed Jesus? She, she viewed Jesus as the Messiah. Yes. And that is a huge difference. And eternity is really at stake. Whether you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior is all how you view him. Right. And, and also for that next step, for those that are, are believers, how are you showing gratitude? You know, I think that, that the, the woman, she didn't know that God was going to, or Jesus was going to use her as an example right here. That's right. But God, God used that time. Jesus used that example to point others to him. That's right. So God can use our gratitude and the gratitude we have. So if you've not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would love to talk to you about that. There should be a number on the screen that's popping up now. You can text that number. Uh, you can text the word SAVED, and that'll, that'll reach out to the, uh, the ministers on staff here at Hopewell. We'd love to talk to you more about what it means to trust Christ, to, to be a, a Christ follower, uh, to know that, that you can have uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ. We would love to do that. That's the whole reason we're doing this, That's right. to, to help you know who Jesus is and to live your life for him. So please reach out to us. I'm gonna have a word of prayer and we'll, we'll be finished for today. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for Luke chapter seven, especially this passage. Lord, thank you that, that you love each one of us. You love Simon. You love uh, this woman. We don't even know her name. And you love each one of us and you've got a plan and a purpose for each one of us. So, Lord, if there, if there be anybody watching this that doesn't know you, uh, Lord, I just pray that you would draw them closer to you and they would trust you uh, as their Lord and Savior. But also, Lord, for the Christians that are watching this, Lord, may you give us all opportunities to, to show the gratitude and express that gratitude that we have for you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.